Hey folks, Eric Stackelbeck here. Welcome to a Watchmen newscast live stream. It is day 14 of Israel's war with Hamas terrorist, Iran-backed Hamas terrorist in Gaza. We are coming right. to you live every single day during this war with breaking updates, analysis, commentary, some great interviews we've had over the past two weeks, including yesterday, our good friend Amir Sarfati of Behold Israel. If you missed that stream yesterday, it's all right here on the channel. Just go to Newscast on our homepage, and it is right there in our archives. While you're there, if you haven't subscribed yet, you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell so you get alerts every time a new video is posted. And we are posting, as I said, every day uh, through the war for such a time as this. We want to be your one-stop shop for everything happening right now in the world's most volatile and chaotic region and how it affects you we want to break down how it affects you and try to make sense of it no matter where you live around the world. So let's dig into it. This was one of the busiest days yet since that massacre, that Hamas invasion of southern Israel on October 7th, 13, 13 days ago, folks. It is hard to believe, but uh, a massacre, a mini holocaust, a, a genocide of these southern villages and towns in southern Israel, the worst massacre of the Jewish people since the Holocaust, since World War II. Let's break down what's going on today. Number one, the big breaking news, right as I'm coming on to you here, uh, coming on with you here, just a little while ago, news was released that two hostages were released by Hamas. Uh, an American daughter, uh, mom and daughter, I believe they live in the Chicago area, were released. We don't have many details at all about this right now, folks. I assume they were dual citizens, perhaps, Israeli U.S. citizens. They were apparently kidnapped by Hamas terrorists from Nakel Oz, uh, a beautiful Jewish community and Israeli kibbutz right along the Gaza border where I have spent time in Nakel Oz. If you watch the opening credits to the Watchmen show on TBN, you see me in a watchtower looking out across Gaza. That is in Nakel Oz, a beautiful community, but thank God. This mother and daughter were released. We don't know what happens now. We don't know how they were released. Was Qatar involved in this? We don't know. They're Hamas's close ally, and they're portraying themselves as a meteor, mediator in all of this, when in reality, folks, uh, Qatar is really a state sponsor of terrorism. We'll talk more about that perhaps on another, another live stream, because we've been talking Iran, and rightfully so, throughout, but Qatar also is a Hamas supporter. Let's throw Erdogan of Turkey in the mix in that Hamas support nexus as well. But two hostages released. Hey, some good news there. Let's hope it's legit and they find their way out of Gaza and back to the United States safely. And don't think Hamas right now is all of a sudden some paragon of virtue since two hostages were released. This is a genocidal, demonic Nazi organization. So it'll be interesting to hear how that all, all unfolded, folks, once more details come out. But that's number one, the big item I wanted to lead with. But number two, and welcome everyone. Uh, we've got thousands with us now. Before we're done, we'll have thousands more from around the world joining us every day here on the live stream. Welcome everyone. God bless. Hezbollah. And we've been talking about this. This is the title, of course, of today's live stream. Hezbollah to the north. Will that second front open? Well, today I believe may have been the most explosive, pun intended, I guess you would say, day of hostilities to the north yet. Now, it's been portrayed in the media over the past week or so as just skirmishes between Israel and Hezbollah. Folks, it is intensifying there in the north on a daily basis. Today, the IDF, the Israel Defense Forces, struck four, count them, four Hezbollah terror cells along that Israel-Lebanon border and one of those cells, I believe it was a three-man cell, was attempting to infiltrate Israel from southern Lebanon when that cell was eliminated, located and eliminated by an Israeli drone. They are no more. And Iran, Hezbollah's statements in the wake of their operatives, their jihadis being taken out over this past week, they'll give a statement. They'll say, yes, so-and-so was taken out. And then they'll say, he was killed while, quote, performing jihad. Uh, yes, indeed. And thankfully, Israel located these Hezbollah jihadists and eliminated them today. And yet, the Hezbollah anti-tank missiles continue to bombard towns in northern Israel. Remember, folks, 
Some 28 Israeli communities along that northern border have been evacuated by Israel thus far, including a beautiful community that I love called Metula. It is the northernmost community in the nation of Israel. Metula continues to be bombarded over the past few days by Hezbollah. And then you have big news today. Kiryat Shimona, uh, a beautiful a beautiful town, uh, larger, about 20,000 people at least live in Kiryat Shimona. But it, it kind of reminds me of the Swiss Alps almost, Kiryat Shimona. It is just a beautiful, beautiful place in northern Israel. It bore the brunt in 2006 during the last Israel Lebanon war when Israel went toe to toe with Hezbollah. Then Hezbollah bombarded Kiryat Shimona with rockets. So Kiryat Shimona, and that was a big step, I believe. It's one of the larger towns there in the north near the Lebanon border, was evacuated today as well, which begs the question. And I'd love to get your thoughts, folks, as we're going here live for the next 30 minutes or so. Leave your comments, leave your questions. Let's have the give and take. I see the chat going right now. It begs the question. How long can Israel wait before it strikes Hezbollah? Hey, we're talking about this coming ground invasion of Gaza, and no one knows that I know of when that's going to happen. It could be tonight. Some thought it was going to come earlier. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It could be a week. It could be two weeks from now. We don't know. And we don't know the deliberations going on within Israel's war cabinet. I can tell you that in Previous months and years, I've in, interviewed most of them, from the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to Ron Dermer, the Strategic Affairs Minister, Zaki Hanegbi, the National Security Advisor, Benny Gantz, who's part of the former Defense Minister, who is part of this unity government right now. I've interviewed all of them. And what I can tell you is this to a man, all four of them in my interviews with them, in conversations, lengthy in some cases. I interviewed Prime Minister Netanyahu for 35 minutes a few months ago. They are adamant and resolute that the Iranian regime will never, ever acquire a nuclear weapon on their watch. It was very interesting because, look, Benny Gantz is not a member of the Likud party. Hanegbi, Dermer, Netanyahu, obviously Likud members. But all, and it seems to be a theme across all Israeli political uh, factions that they differ. And hey, look, folks, we saw before this Hamas madness began two weeks ago, we obviously saw massive demonstrations in Israel, these judicial reform demonstrations. So clearly, Israel has a very lively democracy and people disagree and they go at it. No doubt. Go to a Knesset meeting. It gets very, very fiery. I've attended some of them. But interestingly enough, one topic that every Israeli political party, for the most part, other than the extreme left and some of the Arab parties, they can all agree, the rational actors from the center to the right, that there's no way under any circumstances that Iran will ever be permitted to develop nuclear weapons. Why am I bringing this up? You might say, hey, you're just talking about Hezbollah. Now you're shifting to Iran. Two reasons. Number one, the Iranian regime, you cannot talk about Hezbollah in the north. And by the way, before we're done, don't worry, we're going to talk more Hamas and Gaza as well and what's happening. Hang tight. We've got a lot to discuss today. But you can't talk about Hezbollah and the threat to the north, whether it's in southern Lebanon, where Hezbollah rules with an iron fist, or next door in Syria, can't talk about that theater, so to speak, without talking about the head of the snake, the Iranian regime. Folks, October 7th, a date that will live in infamy, Israel's 9-11, would never have happened without the Iranian regime, without its active support, training, and arming of Hamas, and also, excuse me, in Gaza, Palestinian Islamic Jihad. I repeat, just as we could say 9-11 would have never happened without the Taliban actively supporting and harboring al-Qaeda, many would say that, this Hamas onslaught, this massacre, would never have happened without Iran's active support and cheerleading and training. Now, I'm going somewhere here. After 9-11, the United States went after the Taliban in Afghanistan. The Taliban was harboring, giving safe haven to al-Qaeda on Afghan soil. So the U.S. went after both. They toppled the Taliban, and we know how that ended. Unfortunately, how it ended up. Oh, man, a little over two years ago, courtesy of the Biden administration. Now the Taliban is back in power, but let's focus on 2001. The U.S. went 
to not only the terror organization itself, but the benefactor, the supporter, the host of that terror organization, it was the Taliban. So put yourselves in Israel's shoes right now. If you're Israel, you know that possibly the darkest day in the history of the state. Uh, look, Israel miraculously reborn in 1948 has had many dark moments and dark days, sadly, because of genocidal enemies that surround it, whether it was the 1948 War for Independence, the Yom Kippur War, the First and Second Intifada, the Second Lebanon War, the First Lebanon War. We could go on and on. The Six-Day War, obviously, miraculous victory. More on that in a minute. But this October 7th, many Israelis are saying this was the darkest day in the history of the state. Folks, guess what? The Iranian regime was behind the darkest day in the history of the state of Israel, the modern state of Israel. That can be said without hesitation. You might say, well, wait a minute. The Biden administration said that uh, Iran, there's no direct link to Iran and October 7th. Well, number one, suppose there's not, and I believe there most likely is, and more details will emerge, I believe. We're only two weeks in here. More will emerge in the days to come, I believe. But two things to keep in mind. Uh, number one, in the run-up, and we reported this here on The Watchman, this is why you're here, to get this kind of information. In the run-up to October 7th, the Iranian regime, members of Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, were meeting with leaders from Hezbollah, leaders from Hamas, leaders from Islamic Jihad in Beirut, planning meetings. Now, I'm sure they weren't planning a picnic uh, or a family get-together. They were planning a massive terror attack, the fruits of which we saw, the bitter fruits, the deadly fruits on October 7th. So number one, we've got the planning, clearly. And number two, we've got the arming, the supporting, the ideological support, the physical support with weapons, and the cheerleading. So perhaps Iran didn't know the very minute and hour that Hamas jihadis were going to burst through the border fence and invade southern Israel two weeks ago. But their fingerprints are all over it, and it would not have happened. I repeat, the darkest day in the history of the modern state of Israel would not have happened without the Iranian regime. So if you're Benjamin Netanyahu and you realize that, what do you do? It's one thing to eliminate Hamas. Amen. And Israel is in the process of fulfilling that goal, I believe. Benjamin Netanyahu said we will, quote, crush Hamas out of existence, essentially, and I believe that's coming. And he said last week, look, this war is going to change the face of the Middle East forever, for generations. And I brought up here on the live stream over the past few weeks, you can't do that. You can't change the face of the Middle East. That's a big goal, right? You can't do that by simply destroying Hamas. That's great. And it changes your immediate backyard and what's happening there. But if you want to change the face of the entire region, you got to go after Hezbollah and you, you eventually have to address the head of the snake, the Iranian regime. If Hezbollah gets goes all in in this war, opens up that second front, I believe it's a good possibility, and they begin to bombard with uh, Israel with rockets, Israel is going to take that opportunity to crush Hezbollah as well, folks. Mark my words. A decisive defeat, not only of Hamas, but of Hezbollah as well. Hezbollah, I believe, and Hamas already has, but I believe Hezbollah as well will sign its own death certificate, its own death warrant, if it bombards Israel and goes all in and unleashes those 150,000 rockets and missiles that are pointed at every inch of Israel right now. The big question is, is Hezbollah prepared to do that? Is Hezbollah and I'm going deeper here with the head of the snake in a minute. I want to quote directly from my good friend Joel Rosenberg and his observations about a larger war between Israel and Iran. A fascinating analysis from Joel. Bear with me for about uh, 30 seconds here. The big question right now, we've laid this out, is if Hamas is on the verge of extinction, then, I mean, Israel goes in on the ground, air, land, and sea, then does Hezbollah get involved to essentially bail out Hamas and save it from utter destruction? Can the Iranian regime afford to lose Hamas is what I'm saying. The Iranian regime, it's, it's uh, look, Hamas has been a boon to Iran's regional goals, its strategy, its ring of fire, and more on that in a minute. Yemen heating up now, more on that in a minute. Bear with me. 
this ring of fire that surrounds Israel on all sides, Gaza has been a crucial ring of that ring of fire. Whether it's Hamas or Islamic Jihad in Gaza, creating much more than a distraction for Israel, a massive threat. The deadliest day in Israel's history, Hamas was responsible for. It's been great for Iran and Iran's strategy. And it's been a persistent thorn in Israel's side, has the situation in Gaza been? Is Iran prepared to let that go and just say, Hamas, you're on your own now. We don't want to use Hezbollah now. We want to continue to hold Hezbollah in reserve to fight another day. And that other day, folks, would be when Israel, not if, I think at this point, but when Israel strikes Iran's nuclear facilities, Hezbollah would be Iran's main means of response to an Israeli attack on Iran's nuclear facilities. Here's what my good friend Joel Rosenberg said, wrote and actually talked about on his show, The Rosenberg Report, uh, which you can see on TBN, where you can also see The Watchman every week. Here's what Joel wrote. Uh, I'm going to keep it brief. You can check him out, first of all, on The Rosenberg Report. Joel actually has a YouTube channel here as well. And All Israel News, that's allisrael.com. Great site with great analysis from Joel. Uh, here's what he says. Iran is just as guilty of the slaughter of more than 1,400 Israelis as Hamas is. That means, he writes, the supreme leader of Iran is just as culpable for killing more Jews in 14 days than at any other time since the Holocaust. We also know that Hezbollah, Iran's proxy terror armor, army in Lebanon, with its 200,000 missiles all aimed at Israel, is itching to join the fight. So this is what Joel concludes. He says, that's why I'm certain that Netanyahu and his war cabinet, including Defense Minister Yoav Gallant, Benny Gantz, uh, Ron Dermer, the Strategic Affairs Minister, and Gadi Eisenkot, another former Israel Defense Forces Chief of Staff, Joel says that's why I'm certain that Netanyahu and his war cabinet are actively discussing the possibility of launching a preemptive and massive strike against Iran and assassinating Iran's leaders soon possibly before the IDF goes into Gaza. Catch your breath here as you're listening to this. He says, why not cut off the head of the snake first, especially if Israel is already going to be in a two-front war with Hamas and Hezbollah in the coming days? Put another way, Joel writes, what's the point of leaving the Iranian regime and its nuclear program alone when Israel is already going to war with two of Iran's terror prospect, uh, proxies and he believes Netanyahu has perhaps also discussed this with Joe Biden. Now, Joel makes very clear that, look, he has, he says, look, I have no inside information here, okay? He's not claiming any inside nugget. He's just concluding this by observing the situation, the lay of the land, seeing how things are developing. And like me, we've both interviewed Israeli leaders over the past few years. And I think he is very on point. Uh, with his analysis that this is a possibility. He's not saying that's going to happen, but he's saying, hey, this is a possibility. And I think I'd like to hear what you think. You know what I think. I'd like to hear what you think. We've got a very active chat going on here right now. Does Israel, is there a chance, as Joel Rosenberg lays out, that Israel goes to the head of the snake and targets Iran directly? As I said, October 7th would not have happened without Iran. Hezbollah would not exist without Iran. Iran created Hezbollah in 1982, folks. It is literally an arm of the Iranian regime. Hezbollah is essentially Iran West, based in southern Lebanon. So Hamas, October 7th, wouldn't have happened, and Hamas would probably be dead at this point and gone without Iranian support propping it up over the years. Hezbollah wouldn't even exist without the regime in Tehran. And what about the Houthis? Let's move on now a little bit. I want to get your thoughts. I threw it out there with Joel uh, wrote and and his analysis that he believes that the Netanyahu team is actively considering expanding this and going right to the head of the snake. What do you think? Do you think that's a possibility based on what you're seeing? Where does that go? That means, hey, it's already a regional war if Israel's going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Hamas and Hezbollah. Folks, and let me preface it by saying, no one wants to see a war, a regional war, or anything like this. But let me also say that Israel is in a struggle right now for its very existence. And if Israel leaves Hamas, Hezbollah, the Iranian regime to fight another day, 
there will be another day. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So not sure what Israel's thinking, Israeli leaders. And Joel said, look, he has no inside info on that. That's just kind of a scenario that he put out there in his reading on the situation. We shall see. What do you think? Is that a possibility? Uh, does Israel limit this to just striking Hamas in Gaza? Or does Israel expand this to target, number one, Hezbollah, and number two, perhaps the Iranian regime? And I said at the top, I don't know how long Israel can put off really facing off with Hezbollah, because every day now, I mean, look, Israel uh, eliminated, targeted four Hezbollah cells today alone. And those anti-tank missiles continue to be fired by Hezbollah. Israel's evacuated communities, Kiryat Shimonite evacuated. How long can Israel stand by and not decisively end these Hezbollah provocations along the border? Again, Hezbollah has not gone all in yet. All in would mean unleashing tens of thousands of rockets. But does Israel preemptively strike them before they can go all in? I mentioned the Six-Day War a few minutes ago. In 1967, June of 67, Egypt and Syria were perched on Israel's borders, ready to invade. Israelis were nervous. Israelis were digging trenches. And, and who, know, who knew what was going to happen? Jordan eventually got involved as well. What did Israel do? Over the protests of then U.S. President Lyndon Johnson, Israel struck preemptively against Egypt, against Syria, and against Jordan. And the rest is history where Israel uh, won a resounding, miraculous victory in the Six-Day War. Is that a possibility this time? If you know the threats are gathering, and you know that you're eventually going to have to face off with not only Hamas, that's a given, but Hezbollah and the, and the head of the snake, the Iranian regime as well, do you strike first before they strike you? And I think that's a question. I think Joel's spot on. I think that's the question that Israeli leaders are considering and facing right now. Perhaps that's why you see a delay in a ground invasion of Gaza. And another reason for that clearly is, look, this is not something to be done haphazardly. And I feel for Israeli soldiers right now, folks, look, I've talked to some of them. They're on the border. They're waiting. I have friends on the front lines. They're waiting. They're all in and they want to uh, get justice and, and destroy Hamas, which slaughtered 1,400 of their fellow countrymen and women. So they're ready. They're poised. They're raring to go. But prudence, wisdom here, and look, Gaza is a death trap, booby trap, tunnels, the whole nine yards. So it, a lot of people are saying, why hasn't Israel gone in yet? Hey, I felt the same way because you want justice done after what happened on October 7th. But there also needs to be wisdom and a strategy. And no one's better at that, that strategy, that intelligence, even though October 7th, obviously massive failure on that end. I don't believe you'll see that happen again in the land of Israel, in the nation of Israel. So we shall see what happens there. Something to keep an eye on. I mentioned Yemen. Before we dig into that, you might be saying, Yemen, where's that on the map? Some people might ask. Well, I'm going to tell you all about the Houthis in Yemen in a minute and why they're now throwing their hats in the ring. And I'm not an I told you so guy, but hey, if you watch the newscast, you know we've been talking about this um, for years now, the ring of fire and the possibility not just of Hamas, Hezbollah, but the Houthis in Yemen and those militias in Iraq and Syria. Well, guess what? Iran is pushing the buttons right now and activating the, the Houthis and those militias in Iraq and Syria. And it's not just Israel that's the target. But one thing to consider, uh, my friend Jonathan Shanzer of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, pardon me as I'm looking down, just looking at my phone. He tweeted today. Can you still say tweet? It's called X now, <laughs> that social media platform. But on X, Jonathan wrote, that now that the Ashley Hospital flap is over, we reported on this the past few days, uh, Hamas and the world, much of the world, falsely accused Israel of striking this hospital in Gaza City when, in reality, it was a misfired rocket fired by Palestinian Islamic Jihad that caused a major explosion in this hospital and killed Palestinian civilians. Didn't stop the world from hopping on the story and blaming Israel, but now the facts are out. And Jonathan writes, look next at the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City. Why? And Israel would never intentionally target a hospital and target civilians. The most humane fighting force in human history is the Israel Defense Forces, along with the U.S. military, in my humble opinion. The IDF goes to extraordinary lengths, even putting its own soldiers at risk 
to avoid civilian casualties. Nonetheless, Jonathan writes, at the Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, that's a command center for Hamas. They do it on purpose, folks. They do it intentionally. And it, it makes me laugh because some people say, oh, Israel's targeting civilians. Well, consider this and wrap your head around this. And I know this can be hard for the pro-Hamas crowd to wrap their head around facts and common sense, but here goes. If Israel indeed did intentionally target or has a policy of intentionally targeting civilians, then why would Hamas and Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah in Lebanon intentionally place their fighters and their weaponry and their rocket launchers in civilian areas? Because they know that Israel will not target civilian areas. So for Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, these are safe havens. Hey, let's put these rocket launchers in a hospital or in a school or in a playground where there's civilians around. They intentionally use Palestinian and Lebanese civilians, in the case of Hezbollah, as human shields. It's diabolical. It's evil. It's a double war crime. But that is what they do. Now, if Israel was just haphazardly bombing civilian sites and with not, not any regard for civilian life, then Hamas and Islamic Jihad and Hezbollah wouldn't do that. They wouldn't intentionally position their rocket launchers in civilian areas. Does that make sense? Is the math adding up? Because some seem to have trouble understanding that. I think it's pretty elementary, but uh, there you go. So that's why you see, as Jonathan Chanza writes, much of the Hamas command center, command and control and leadership including the military leadership, including perhaps, perhaps he's there, the most, he may be Israel's most wanted man, Mohammed Deif, who is Hamas's main military commander. He's been on the run for years. They apparently, a good deal of them, could be holed up in this Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City. So get ready. Jonathan writes, get ready. Al-Shifa will be the new rallying cry by the anti-Israel forces around the world. You'll see propaganda videos if indeed Israel eventually says, well, the command and control for Hamas, the leadership is in this hospital. We eventually probably have to target this hospital. We'll take great pains to get any civilians out of there, but get ready. So I want to throw that out there. Jonathan, I think is prescient, good word there for you, when he talks about that possibility, the Al-Shifa hospital in Gaza City being a new rallying cry for the pro-Hamas crowd. Now, let's talk about Yemen, uh, Syria, and Iraq. And I said, not only Israel is being targeted, the United States right now uh, feeling the brunt as Iran again activates the Ring of Fire. Quick refresher course, if you haven't joined us before, what is the Ring of Fire? It is that uh, collection of Iran-backed terror groups that surround Israel, which is the size of the state of New Jersey. Quick reminder, surround Israel on all sides. It includes Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza, Hezbollah to the north and southern Lebanon, Hezbollah and various Shia militias to the northeast in Syria. Then to the east, we have more Iran-backed militias in Iraq. Oh, and by the way, further south, about 1,000 miles south of Israel, we've got the Houthis in Yemen. Well, the Houthis were pretty active yesterday. Out of Yemen, the Houthis launched three cruise missiles in the direction of Israel. Thankfully, a U.S. Navy warship in the Red Sea intercepted those missiles, but obviously a very troubling signal there. That's another ring on the ring of fire. We've got Gaza, we've got Lebanon, we've got Syria, where rockets and missiles have been launched from over the past two weeks. The Houthis have been itching to get involved. For the past three years against Israel, their leadership has made statements out of Yemen again and again. Who are the Houthis? Well, they swept this Iran-backed Shia terror group, swept into the Yemeni capital of Sana'a back in 2014. They they fought the Saudis, the UAE, for, for the past several years. There's been relative calm and quiet over the past year or so. And now will things heat up again, courtesy of the Houthis? This is all I'm going to say about them, folks. Would you like to know, you might say, the Houthis, the who? Never heard of them before. Yemen, where's Yemen? Okay, this is what you need to know about the Houthis. It's pretty basic. Again, here's their official slogan. This is the slogan that the Houthis live by. This is their marching orders. It's on their flags. This is what they believe. The slogan of the Houthi movement is, quote, God Allah, in their words, Allah, their God Allah, is the greatest, Allah is the greatest, death to America, death to Israel, 
curse on the Jews, victory to Islam. Other than that, they are perfectly moderate and reasonable chaps, I assure you. In all seriousness, this is the same organization, death to America, death to Israel, a curse on the Jews, jihad is the way. The same organization that upon entering office in January 2021, one of his first acts in the foreign policy realm, Joe Biden, was to remove the Houthis from the U.S. terror list as a designated terrorist organization. Why? Because he was trying to charm the Houthis' masters in Tehran, the Iranian regime. And the foreign policy of the administration in D.C. has become very apparent in the ensuing time where it has released billions to the Iranian regime and desperately begged Iran for a new nuclear deal. The list goes on. So that was one of the original fatal mistakes of the Biden administration. It sent the completely wrong message to remove the Houthis from the terror list. And we're seeing the bitter fruits of that right now. Will the Houthis get involved? And hey, it is not beyond Israel's reach to strike the Houthis as well in Yemen. So who knows where this is going as we talk about other fronts opening. And we have to talk about Syria and Iraq when we're talking about additional fronts. Um, the U.S., there are some 900 U.S. troops in Syria right now. I believe two or 3,000 in Iraq right now. And as we've reported this week, there are 2,000 more poised to perhaps be deployed to the region as well. But nonetheless, uh, these Iranian-backed, key point there, Iranian-backed Shia militias in Iraq and Syria have been very active over the past two days uh, striking U.S. bases there with rockets and drones. So what is Iran's game here? We know that two U.S. aircraft carrier groups are on the Mediterranean coast right now, off the coast of Israel. As I mentioned, U.S. troops might deploy. Uh, is Iran, what is Iran trying to do here? Are they trying to send a message to the U.S.? Don't you dare get involved or there will be consequences for your soldiers in Syria and Iraq? A broader question here, we've asked this a bunch over the past week or so, once news of the carrier groups traveling to the Middle East uh, became apparent, we've asked, okay, the carrier groups are going, more troops may de be deployed, but do Iran and Hezbollah look at that and say, there's no teeth behind it. It's all just for show. We don't think Biden will really use them. I think that's a big question. And I have to say, uh, the president's speech last night did not inspire much confidence, in my view. He talked more, it seemed, about Ukraine and the threat of Islamophobia than he did Israel and the war here and the Iranian regime and uh, the Jews that were massacred two weeks ago. Just my take in watching it. But let's see what else we have before we go. And we've got incredible chat going on right now. So good stuff, everyone. Let's see if we have anything else to cover, folks, before we go. Hmm. I think we covered a lot today in 32 minutes. Wow. Hey, more to come tomorrow here live. I know what I wanted to mention before I go. Very important point here. Last mention here. Stick with me. A lot of people have asked uh, over the past two weeks, Eric, what can I do to help directly? I can't get to Israel right now. I'm not on the ground there. How can I help the people of Israel who are struggling right now, suffering? Again, the worst massacre for the Jewish people since the Holocaust. Communities in southern Israel, beautiful communities, evacuated wholesale. Close to 30 communities in northern Israel, evacuated wholesale. In all, we have some 300,000, probably more now, displaced Israelis as a result of this war and this Hamas heinous attack. How can you help? There's a great organization that I've worked with frequently called Mayor Panim. Check them out at mpgive.org. That's mpgive.org. Folks, they're on the ground right now doing God's work, helping these beleaguered Israeli communities in southern Israel, the terror victims of the massacre on October 7th, and also up north, uh, helping those communities as well. If you want to help, Mayor Panim is a good place to start. You're also fulfilling that biblical mandate laid out in Genesis 12, 3, to bless the people of Israel for such a time as this. I speak from personal experience. Mayor Panim's the real deal. I don't partner with many organizations here on The Watchman, but if I do, you know I believe in them. mpgive.org, you can help. 
check them out. Hey, it's been quite a week, and it ain't over. Tomorrow we'll be back with you here for a live stream. I believe we will go a little earlier, but maybe 2, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Don't worry. We'll send an alert out on social media and right here on the community tab on YouTube. We'll let you know what time we are rolling tomorrow. But thanks so much for joining us today here on The Watchman. Continuing prayer. Prayer works until tomorrow. God bless you. And remember, never hold your peace. Hey, everyone. Thanks for checking out The Watchman Newscast. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you never miss an upload. And tap the bell icon so you're notified every time a new video is posted. And don't forget to share your thoughts, insights, and comments below. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow.